Welcome back. You're watching Showdown, and I'm joined now live out of Parliament House by Kelly O'Dwyer from the Liberal Party, the new member for Higgins. Thanks for your company. Hi, Peter. I keep calling you the new member, but you've been there for a while now. And we're also joined by Dr Andrew Lee, former economics professor from ANU. Uh, thank you for your company as well. G'day, Peter. All right. Guys, now, I've seen you debate on other Sky shows and, and often, you know, you can start talking over the top of each other. We don't want that. I want a serious economic debate, something different in Australian media. Uh, we've got a situation where, unusually for this show, when you have most politicians on, uh, not necessarily talking about our last guest, uh, they don't know that much about the economy. Now, instead here, we've got a former economics professor representing the Labor Party and we've got a former senior economic advisor to one of the best treasuries in the country's history, Peter Costello, and you, Kelly O'Dwyer. So, guys, let's keep it real. Uh, first question, debt and deficits. Now, the Liberal Party is always telling us uh, that it's incredibly high under Labor uh, and that it's moving too quickly. The Labor Party is always saying that the Liberal Party are over-inflating it. Uh, start with you, if I can, Andrew Lee. How is it over-inflated uh, when the Liberal Party make these comments? Uh, well, Peter, I think the useful starting point is to bring things back to a household scale. Uh, Australian debt will peak at around $9,000 uh, a person, and uh, that's about the level of debt that a typical Australian might take on, say, to buy a small car. Uh, we took on that debt because when the global financial crisis hit, uh, it takes away a lot from government revenues. Uh, in fact, two-thirds of the debt we took on was just to make up for the fact that company profits fell and personal income tax ca take uh, decreased as well, well. Dr Lee, let me just uh, jump in for a moment just to get a response sure. from Kelly O'Dwyer on this. Um, how much less debt do you believe the coalition would have taken on if what uh, Andrew Lee says is the case, is that it was really debt that just came on courtesy of the GFC? Well, it's clearly not just because of the GFC. I mean, we supported the first package that was brought forward by the government, but we said the size and scale of spending on the second package was going to do nothing to actually contribute to increasing productivity in the country. We said, in fact, that it was reckless, uh, and we've said quite rightly, as you can see through their spending on such things as pink bats, where they spent more than $2.4 billion on that particular scheme, that in fact it was wasteful spending. It was spending that was going to do nothing to improve our economy and improve the job prospects of ordinary Australians. So, so we think that, that you know, Andrew's right on one point, which is that it is incredibly high for every Australian. $9,000 if you're, if you're talking about it. But that's not that's high, clearly that's, Australian... that's, not, that's not high by what individuals have in terms of debt. I mean, you don't want to hear how much debt I've got. Your average Australian's got much more debt than $9,000 each. Yeah, but, but there's a big difference. I mean, uh, you, when you take on debt, um, Peter, you're, you're actually making your own choices about the debt that you take on. The Australian government has to be very responsible when it takes on debt because ultimately, at the end of the day, you, Peter, and all of those people who are watching this program tonight, ultimately the Australian taxpayer is going to be paying but for can, it. Can I ask you a question know... back on that, though, before we go back to Andrew? My question back on that is that isn't a difference that makes debt for the individual more worrying than debt for the nation that the individual has a lifespan ahead of retirement that they have to save for, whereas the nation is eternally lived. There are always people of taxpaying age uh, to be able to pay off debt. I always hear economists telling me that that's why national debt is actually less scary uh, than individual debt. Yeah, well, well, Peter, just just let me refer to Europe as, as as one recent example. I mean, we've saw we saw successive increases in debts and deficits in Europe over you know a number of generations there, and they are ultimately now paying the price. And we are seeing the significant financial impact of that, the economic impact of that, but also the social impact when you look at countries like Spain, where you have uh, unemployment now at, at upwards of 24%, where youth unemployment is up around 44%. Mm. The economic impact on that generation, the generations to follow that are paying back that debt is incredibly significant. So it, it's not good enough to simply say, well, some other generation well, and can pay for that. Okay. We, are, we are stealing from future generations if well, we impose a debt burden upon them. Well, let me go back to Andrew Lee on this because, Dr Lee, um, what Kelly O'Dwyer is talking about is, is a fair point in terms of the debt trajectory for Australia, isn't it? You say it's only $9,000 That's per head. That's a lot less than it is in Europe, clearly. Um, but by the same token, one of our Twitter followers has said that since 2008, Australian debt has risen by the third largest in the world. I'm not sure if that figure is right, um, yeah, but is that right in your view that we are actually exponentially seeing debt increase at too high a rate, even if where it's got to isn't that high, perhaps, uh, because of the person that Kelly O'Dwyer used to work for, Peter Costello? 
Uh, no, that's, that's not right, Peter. Uh, I mean, uh, Australia's debt uh, peaked in the last financial year and the budget is now back in surplus and Australia's debt is falling again. Uh, and, uh, and that's the right thing to do. I mean, Kelly makes a good point in the comparison with Europe, uh, but I think, respectfully, she draws the wrong lesson from it. Uh, a country like France has not run a budget surplus for 30 years. Uh, that is clearly bad management. Uh, there are plenty of European countries that have debt levels equal equal to their annual incomes, uh, debt burdens of 100% or more of GDP. Uh, Australia's, by contrast, uh, is uh, going to peak at less than 10% of GDP. Uh, what do we get from that? Well, we make sure that the next generation isn't blighted by unemployment. Um, I think you and I are about the same age, Peter, and so that means we probably both left high school around the time of the early 90s recession. Uh, that was a pretty tough time for a, a young person to be looking for a job. Uh, unemployment hit 11%. Uh, and so there are intergenerational costs of not going into debt, uh, of not make, keeping unemployment low, uh, of not keeping the economy ticking over. That's, that's why it's the right can, thing can to I, do to temporarily take on the, debt, then pay it down. The, the, I understand that theory, but I've got to ask this follow-up question, and I think this is where some viewers might be a little bit cynical about uh, the, the, the charting back to surplus, is that every time we've had a budget delivered, as opposed to the forecast budget for the following financial year, the level of debt in the last few years, granted after the GFC, has been high, and in a number of cases much higher than was actually predicted. So the last one was 40 odd billion dollars. Yes, the Treasury is predicting a $1.5 billion surplus, um, but he was predicting at one stage a $12 billion deficit instead of a $40 billion deficit. And I think viewers see that and they just don't believe that there is a course back to surplus, uh, even though that's what we're told in the forecast. How do you answer that? Oh, Peter, we will bring the budget back into surplus. We've been very clear about that and we've been clear that uh, if there are changes in the economic circumstances that we'll make the changes necessary in order to bring the budget back into surplus. We've made a, a firm commitment uh, and I've got to say I've been criticised by some of my friends on the left for this uh, but I do think it's the right thing to do for a government uh, to make a clear commitment to bring the budget back into surplus. So I think setting down those clear standards that you intend to meet uh, is important for confidence in financial markets. It is important for governments uh, to say that they will bring the budget back into surplus and, and to do that, and that, that's what we're doing. Uh, but it's important to be clear as to the, the human toll uh, of not putting in place that fiscal stimulus and uh, not making up for the revenue write-downs in the global financial crisis. Well, uh, Treasury's estimates is that uh, our fiscal stimulus saved about 200,000 jobs. Well, can, can I get a Tens response to that? Sorry to interrupt, but let me get a response to, to those sort of figures because I'm sure she's aware of all of them. Uh, Kelly O'Dwyer... Treasury does make that forecast. How can you reject that? Well, well first, can I just, just pick Andrew up on his, his earlier point? Um, because it's very important. He, he said before that, that the government had delivered a surplus. The government, of course, hasn't delivered a surplus. The government has projected a $1.5 billion surplus, and yet debt is increasing. Um, net debt is actually going to peak at over $144 billion dollars uh, the year after next. So it's not correct to simply say that debt isn't increasing. The government hasn't reduced spending. It's actually increased expenditure by over a hundred a hundred billion dollars to the budget. Let me just and stop you there and just see if he... Spending. Sorry to interrupt, but let me just see if uh, Andrew Lee accepts that. Do you accept what Kelly O'Dwyer just said? No, Peter. There's, there's not a single year of the Fraser or Howard governments where real spending was cut in real terms. Uh, there's five years of Labor governments since the mid-80s where spending has been cut in real terms. Real spending cuts are hard. It actually means you have to cut government spending by more than inflation. Uh, and frankly, Peter Costello never managed to do that. All right, well, I'll get you, guys uh, to, let's, let's, let's get you guys to talk to each other here. Don't talk to me. Settle this between you because you are basically <laughs> arguing over something that should be a fact that we can just get to the bottom of. Well, 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 clearly they have increased spending. I mean, you know, it's in the budget papers. They have increased spending. It's on the budget bottom line. It's ongoing spending. They're talking about the fact that, that they're somehow reducing spending, and yet, of course, this is not something that we can see in the budget figures themselves. Okay, so well, Andrew Lee, misleading. don't be a gentleman. Let's, let's see the response to that. What is the response to that? Real spending has been cut. So what Kelly is talking about is, is nominal dollar spending, but we've had inflation, yes, and when you, when you account for that inflation, uh, real, real spending has fallen. It's actually increased by over $100 billion. So but, but, I, think, I think we'll 
but agree so, so, to disagree so you are, on okay, that. Okay, so this one of you is talking about... Disagree. So, Andrew Lee, you're talking about real spending, which factors yes. in inflation and so forth, and Kilo Dwyer, you're talking about the actual dollar amount. Is that is that right? Correct. Exactly okay, right. Well, we've, we've at least got one thing that we can agree to disagree on, <laughs> even if you won't agree. We are going to take a commercial break. When we come back, uh, we're going to continue this economic debate, and I want to talk uh, to both Kelly O'Dwyer and Andrew Lee about whether this is a good or a bad thing for the Australian economy that we have low interest rates, low unemployment and low inflation. At first look, obviously, it all seems nice and rosy that they're all low, but what does it mean? Is it necessarily signs that the economy is doing well or is things like low interest rates a sign that there are some economic waves ahead? You're watching Showdown. Welcome back. You're watching Showdown. We're moderating a debate between the Liberal Party's Kelly O'Dwyer and Dr Andrew Lee for the Labor Party. And we're moving on now to discuss low inflation, low interest rates and low unemployment and whether this is necessarily all good or some bad for the economy. Andrew Lee, can I just quickly start with you? Uh, we've had a tweet that came in from someone saying, ask one of them to explain how the employment figures are worked out. Can you support a family with a part-time job? Whenever there's crowing about low unemployment rates, it's a fair point, isn't it, that too many people are in part-time work rather than full-time work? Uh, well, Peter, some of part-time work is a reflection of choices. It's people, uh, for example, uh, balancing work and family. Uh, some of it, as you, as you rightly point out, is people who would like more hours. Uh, but what we saw in the last employment statistics was not only low unemployment, but also a pretty substantial tick up in the participation rate, the share of working age people uh, who are in the labour market. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a really good sign, I think. One of the big crises in the US since the global financial crisis is uh, not just unemployment, but the people that gave up looking for work, those discouraged workers uh, who just sat at home. Uh, we don't have that. We have a, a labour market, 5% uh, unemployment, which by international standards is extraordinarily good. Uh, and with inflation uh, sitting now below 2%, uh, you know, these are, these are really good uh, economic fundamentals. Uh, and I think the nation can frankly be, be pretty and, proud of them. And Kelly O'Dwyer, you can't disagree with that, can you? I mean, even Joe Hockey says the figures are the figures. At the end of the day, low inflation and low unemployment are two things that the government can at least get a pat on the back for, surely. Well, of course, the, the government and the Prime Minister in particular over at the G20 right now is actually crowing about Australia's position. She's effectively saying that Australians haven't had it so good. Her hubris and arrogance on this point, I think, leaves a lot of Australians pretty cold. And I don't think that that reflects the real experience of a lot of people, a lot of people who are actually struggling are in the current economic climate. Are you referring to the patchwork climate. economy? Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, well, look, it is a very patchwork economy. I mean, you look at the West, uh, it's, it's effectively going gangbusters, whereas you compare it to a state like mine in Victoria, where there are a lot more challenges, um, in particular around retail. Uh, we also have real challenges around manufacturing, and those challenges are going to be made more manifest come the 1st of July when we're hit with the first and most enormous world's largest carbon tax, which is an economy-wide carbon tax, which is going to make it even more difficult for so many of those sectors. And yet this is something, of course, that the government isn't talking about. Well, as an adopted West Australian, I'm happy to say that you guys in Victoria need to lift your game. But uh, sorry, Andrew Lee, what were you going to say? <laughs> Oh, I'm delighted to talk about the carbon well, price of it, if you, you want to. to. Talk it's, about uh, it. Let's talk well, about uh, it for the by, next 10 minutes. By 2015, uh, every OECD country but one uh, will have either a national or a subnational carbon What's price. What's a subnational And the carbon reason price? that they will have that is because that's the most efficient and effective way uh, of reducing carbon pollution. We, we, Don't take I, my I, word I, for I that. Heard, they're, they're Malcolm I heard, Turnbull's words. I heard words. Kelly O'Dwyer there, a subnational carbon tax. You, you mean sort of at a state level or, or that kind of thing like happens in the United States? For example... What he's talking about, he's talking about province, you know, tiny little parts of perhaps, you know, countries. Um, but, but he can't name one country with an economy wide carbon tax. So, the Prime Minister's been asked, the Treasurer has been asked he, this question. Kelly, why, they shouldn't have we be proud? I mean, just playing devil's this. advocate here, shouldn't we be proud of the fact uh, that if you believe uh, that uh, climate change is real, uh, as apparently both political leaders do, even though a lot of people on Twitter that like Tony Abbott don't think he does, uh, if both leaders think that, uh, then at the end of the day, shouldn't we be proud that we're trying to lead the world in changing the situation? 
Well, we've certainly said that we believe we do need to take action on climate change. Nobody disputes that. But the big disagreement is how we affect a sensible plan, given the current global environment and given where the rest of the countries are going. You look at the US, you look at China, you look at Japan, you look at Canada, none of them have got an economy-wide carbon tax and they don't plan on introducing one. You look at India as well, again, not an economy-wide carbon well, tax let, let me and give, don't plan on introducing let me one. Give and Lee, European... Sorry, sorry to interrupt again, but let me just give Andrew Lee a chance to respond to that. Do you accept that, that there are no plans for an economy-wide carbon tax to be introduced or do you take issue with that? Uh, there are plenty of countries that have substantial carbon well, prices. Ours, ours covers 60% uh, of, uh, of the economy. Uh, that's a, a pretty substantial, but not an economy-wide carbon price. Uh, to the question that Kelly raised before about uh, sub-national carbon prices, uh, one example is the 200 million people in China uh, that will be covered by a carbon price. It's, a, it's an extraordinary irony, isn't it, when you think about it. We have this communist planned economy that is using a market-based no, to deal with, da with, uh, with dangerous climate change. Uh, and yet the Liberal Party of Australia is going for a command and control direct action approach for de dealing right. with climate change. All right, change. we're moving away from the economy, so I'm, I'm not going to give you a right of reply back to that, Kelly Do I want to ask you instead about interest rates. Now, interest rates is the third element of the below 5% mix that Wayne Swan likes to crow, as you put it, about. Um, but at the end of the day, are low interest rates necessarily a sign of good economic management or are they a sign of concerns, I guess, in the marketplace about where the global economy is at? I mean, at the end of the day, the Reserve Bank dumps interest rates when it's losing faith in the economy, doesn't it? Well, that's right. The Reserve Bank, of course, has lowered the cash rate just recently because about concerns with the economy, and they continue to do that when there are concerns, and they have flagged that if there are increased concerns that they will continue to cut. Um, but you're right to say that not everybody welcomes uh, you know, low interest rates. Obviously, those who are homeowners Same. do, and, and, and those who are homeowners do appreciate lower interest rates on their average mortgage uh, standard variable home loan rate. However, you're right, self-funded retirees, people who have actually been saving for their retirement, get hit very hard when interest rates are lowered. And uh, this is one of the you know, important aspects as well of this carbon tax as well. And I hate to harp on this, but of course those self-funded retirees are not going to be given any compensation by the government. Um, they're in fact going to, to, to find it very hard if they don't have a, a health care card to, to in fact uh, manage the increased costs that are going to flow from the carbon tax. All right, so they're going to be hit again. Okay, Andrew Lee, let me come back to you on, specifically on the same issue that uh, Kelly O'Dwyer and I started on there. Do you accept as an economist that d declining interest rates in the current economic climate really are simply a reflection uh, of the fact uh, that we have a situation where the world economy is, is sort of in dangerous territory so the Reserve Bank is dumping rates? Uh, well, Peter, they're a reflection of a number of different things. So if you go to the Reserve Bank's uh, minutes, then you can see mention of the global uncertainty, but you also see ref ref uh, references there to the Australian inflation rate, which is low, uh, the half a trillion dollars of investment in the mining uh, industry that's, uh, that's projected, uh, and the low unemployment rate. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that as a result of uh, the government cutting real spending, uh, that's created more scope for the Reserve Bank to cut interest rates. Uh, and they've been clear about the, the relationship. Uh, when we scale back fiscal policy, that gives them room to cut interest rates. Uh, Kelly's right in saying that not everybody benefits from an interest rate cut. Uh, but on the whole, it is regarded as a way of stimulating the economy. All right, uh, let, let, me, let me jump in. Sorry to jump in, but we are less than a minute on program, so very, very quickly. Uh, Kelly O'Dwyer, foreign ownership. You might have heard the Barnaby Joyce interview. What's your view on foreign ownership of agricultural land? Do you have a problem with it? Uh, no, I don't have a problem with foreign ownership of agricultural land. Um, I, I do agree with Barnaby, though, on, on the fact that we need to ensure that uh, foreign investment uh, is not contrary to Australia's national interest and that sovereign-owned funds do need to have a different criteria applied to them. That's already existing under our foreign investment rules, okay, and I I've think got, that, that should continue. OK, I've got to jump in because I'm right out of time. But very quickly, Andrew Lee, uh, what about the idea of uh, subsidising the media, given what's happened at Fairfax, and not just subsidising manufacturing. Any room for that, yes or no? 
I, I, I don't see any scope for that, Peter. I think uh, once governments start getting in the business of running newspapers, I think people would reasonably yeah. ask uh, about, their, about their independence. And Fair so, enough. I obviously, my heart goes out to the Fairfax employees, but I don't think the government can, can dive in there. OK, fair enough. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, but we'll come back to this discussion, no doubt, as the media landscape changes. Kelly O'Dwyer and Andrew Liu, appreciate you both Thanks joining us on Showdown. Thanks, Thanks, Kelly. And thank you for your company as well. We will see you at the same time next week for a special edition of Showdown, which includes Mark Latham and Michael Kroger. Don't miss that.